Yeah, Vijeta, here at live. Perfect. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Vijeta here from the Thai Bangalore team. A very warm welcome to every single one of you. Saturday, 6 p.m., you're taking time out to come here. We have to give you some extra love and extra gratitude because it, and most importantly, it's going to be a very wonderful and interesting session. So a very quick summary that IoT Forum, some of the finest brains are looking at raising the IoT quotient of India, working very hard globally, bringing in some of the stalwarts, bringing in leaders. And of course, today we have Harvinder who's going to be leading the conversation, moderating the discussion. And he has a very interesting background. Of course, he leads the industrial IoT special interest group at the IT Forum. And he's also part of some people like uh, the Product Management uh, International Software Product Management Association, the ISPMA. And of course, he has a professional career as well. He's a volunteer here, like so many of us who are trying to build and grow the community. So he's a software engineer and a very interesting profile, right, Harvinder? You are yeah. like a startup within a very, very large, uh, you know, uh, large, large, large company. And uh, that's like Honeywell. So very, very interesting. So today, the discussions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be around the opportunities, the digital work that is happening in the oil and gas industry, still growing. So I think there's a lot of talk of EV, but uh, oil and gas is where a lot of consumption of oil, petrol, diesel is still happening. So Harvinder, over to you. We are all looking forward to a very, very interesting session. And thank you, of course, to the other two gentlemen, uh, Krishnan and Devashish, for joining us. And to Som from the IoT Forum also is part of the discussions. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot, Vijeta. Uh, thank you. Welcome, everyone, to a panel discussion, uh, industrial IoT webinar. Uh, what are the new technology adoption and digitalization programs in oil and gas industry? And yeah, so we are going to talk about a few things around digital transformation in oil and gas industry. Uh, the, so, so tech is not new to this ONG industry, but what, what has changed drastically is with the big data uh, that is become an enabler for the value creation in the industry. And we have a panel uh, with whom we would be exploring this topic from very different angles. So we have Krishnan Raman, who is co-founder and CEO from Flutura Decision Sciences and Analytics, uh, who brings um, the, the uh, mid-size uh, vendor perspective to the stage. And we have Mr. Devasis, who's, Devasis Gupta, who is the regional business head uh, Middle East and Asia at Agora, which is an IoT venture of Shlambhiji, uh, which is the key player in this space. So welcome to both Krishnan and Devashish. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a lot of, lot of things which is happening in the industry with the digital technologies and with the new push of uh, COVID-19. Uh, there are a lot of activities, right? And some of those have been uh, in bits and pieces and fragmented, which has got a lot of push from covid so I, I, what we are looking for the audience is to learn the value which is getting created with the digital technologies and the way forward in this industry. And with that intro, let me throw it to you, uh, Devashish. Can you give us a little uh, framework of where things are today with this digital transformation? Okay. Thanks, Arvinder. So good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, so in terms of the uh, of where we are, I think we are still in the very, very early stages. I think uh, if you look at the oil and gas sector, um, they have been early adopters of uh, technology when it came to machine to machine communication, satellite connectivity and remote operations. But, um, you know, it was only limited to uh, given the scope, the, the wide spread of the, of the assets, it was kind of limited to SCADA systems for critical equipment. With the, uh, with the advent of you know, the, uh, uh, the, the digital journey that most of the uh, oil and large oil and gas companies are embarking on, uh, they are merely scraping at the very early stages of how they can migrate to a uh, to an environment which is high performance computing. And when I talk about that, there are issues around, you know, migrating to cloud because of data residency uh, and etc. especially here in the Middle East. Uh, so that's one part of the journey. The other part of the journey is to connecting this, this entire gamut of assets, which uh, oil and gas uh, operators have in their different uh, oil fields across the globe. Uh, the idea is how do you connect them um, without spending a lot of capex? You know, the recent downturn has 
force the industry to think differently. And the other thing is that, you know, with the uh, advent of COVID, actually it has accentuated and accelerated some of these uh, developments. So what we are seeing today is a lot of uh, discussion happening, some pilots of proof of values uh, being done um, uh, to test out. But I think it's still a long, long way to go. And it's going to be a uh, very interesting ride over the next few years. Okay, interesting. So Krishnan, what would you add to it? So what Devashish said is it's still um, somewhat in a stage where we are not ready for the, it's not the infection point, right? So what do you think about it? So uh, fully, fully agree with uh, Devashish and the same. So uh, this is the way actually I look at it. Uh, if we were to look at it pre-COVID, uh, and if you were to look at a traditional oil and gas, condition monitoring uh, for critical equipments and critical processes has always been there. Uh, it's not as if actually that is something which is new to the industry. If you go ahead and look at a, a drilling rig, uh, about 20,000 sensors, which are skewing in actually data at a millisecond was always there. However, harnessing that particular data stream to be able to go ahead and actually make certain relevant information, relevant insights and relevant actions. Uh, that was something actually which is new. Uh, and again, COVID has, uh, in my mind, gone ahead and looked at it in terms of bringing in two distinct differences. Uh, so the first is uh, more in terms of actually what I call as remote operations. So this is not just for the critical equipment, we are now talking about actually a situation where people are not able to go to the field. So how can you go ahead and perform remote operations uh, using digital relevant technologies become an important aspect. And the second one uh, is a little different, which is algorithmic monitoring. So for example, the traditional uh, condition monitoring in oil and gas used to be in terms of more and more people being thrown at the problem. So more and more people in the command center uh, going ahead and manually looking at every single attribute of the various data that is streamed in to be able to go ahead and make a decision. So this remote monitoring, the accelerated remote monitoring and remote control and uh, the entire algorithmic piece are two aspects that are different. And this is also giving rise to uh, different themes when it comes in terms of digital technologies uh, as well as uh, what I call as uh, the entire uh, digital thin maturity continuum that the, uh, uh, that the field is going through. So uh, but the entire remote monitoring side, what is happening is you are looking at it in terms of earlier, collecting all information and viewing it. So it was more in terms of actually a passive information oriented uh, digital twin that was there. Now that is giving way to a more active, uh, which is where the algorithmic monitoring comes in, uh, a more active twin, whereby it is not just about actually looking at the information, but being able to understand actually the pulse of the information that is coming in. And to the highest level, which is in terms of actually the cognitive twin, where it is not just about understanding, but also being able to go ahead and look at it in terms of take the right thing. So a passive twin to an active twin to a cognitive twin uh, is a journey that actually we have seen post uh, COVID. This is on one side. On the other side, like where Debashi started, uh, you, you had actually certain critical equipments being monitored uh, as a part of this. But today it is moving and giving way to more evolved use cases. So you start with monitoring and equipment to the next level, multiple equipments being put together to form a process unit. So the entire process unit efficiency, when it comes in terms of individual equipment, it is more in terms of performance of that equipment and more importantly, uh, uptime of that equipment. But moving forward, actually it is giving way to process level use cases and most critically uh, uh, system level use cases where process units and uh, systems are kind of actually working in uh, tandem. Uh, so that's actually the highest level use case. Just to give you an example, uh, one of the places where we have gone ahead and deployed a solution is close to around actually 350 wells. Uh, but it's not just about actually the 350 wells or 80 well pads. 
but also about 100 odd sophisticated equipments actually being built. And uh, equipment going down can affect. It's a gas field, and actually, if you go ahead and look at it, uh, equipment going down can affect in terms of the overall production output at the sales takeoff point. Uh, or if you look at it in terms of uh, uh, asset uh, uh, or a, a process like inefficiency happening also can result in it. Implemented it, we are talking about actually about $150 million uh, potential savings actually in this particular case. And we are talking about a 10x ROI in year one. So those are the kind of opportunities that are coming. Now. Wow, I think that's, that's pretty great. And I think a lot of opportunities are emerging. So adding to this one, uh, Devashish, what do you see as a, a technologies which are bringing the benefits basically to look at uh, reduction in maintenance and repair costs in the MRO area? So, yeah. Okay, great. So, you know, the scope has been ever expanding. So we, when we started off uh, as an outfit, we were created, uh, I think, you know, you were also probably doing the same. We were created as a, start up within a large organization and and trying to see you know how we can address some of the challenges that we face in our operations and we realize that uh, a few things paradigm shifts are happening and they need to happen which is a uh, you have to have an open platform okay which is so you you got to work with your competitors and your end customers and get them on board on the same platform um, uh, then the next thing is how do you manage security? I do. I see an, a question is yeah on data security. So from the time uh, you know you ingest the data, you acquire the data, and and you know you transmit the data and you store the data everywhere. You have to incorporate security uh, in every step of the way. So that's an opportunity for many others. Uh, then on top of that, in terms of analytical techniques or algorithmic, uh, uh, you know. Um, uh, management of equipment there you uh, we are seeing a lot of work which is uh, which is around video based analytics so you know a lot of visual analytical tools which have been developed in other verticals we are actually adopting them for example you know today greenhouse gas monitoring is one of the key challenges uh, faced by everyone and especially in the oil and gas sector so how can you use uh, visual-based analytics, especially in far-flung areas where you do not have good connectivity and hence have to rely on uh, compute, which is happening in situ or right where the where you're generating the, uh, the data. And so we're seeing a lot of work which is happening around that, identifying flares. And then it's not just an identification, it's the closed loop solution where you not only identify that there is an increased emission, but you take an action, i.e., that you know you uh, you you can uh, manage a sort of a valve which will slow down the uh, you know the outflow of hydrocarbons, etc. Uh, then, on um, as Krishnan was alluding to, you know, early there are there is a lot of you know workforce which still goes out in the field to to deliver uh, uh, operations and services, and so. Uh, and it's a high risk area, the oil and gas sector. So you got to monitor how people are working. You know, earlier on, there would be you know, systems in place where uh, you had site safety officers, et cetera, et cetera. Then came the advent of CCTV cameras, but you know you can only do that much uh, with that. And it's, those are all dependent on very good communication setup. So now what we are seeing is again, uh, monitoring of, uh, activities using visual based analytics which where you identify um, certain not only behaviors but also any kind of uh, uh, you know um, uh, risk associated with an operation so that's one part of the story the other part is you know predictive health maintenance so again as i mentioned you know there was a lot of exception based monitoring earlier and again depending on a very um, uh, you know good communication rate, uh, network, but you uh, only a limited number of equipment were actually connected as a result of that and monitored. And all of that monitoring was being done um, a, a, in, a, in a location which was either in the city or whatever, you know, so it's, it was far away from where the uh, where the action was. But now um, people want to know immediately as and when um, 
uh, an issue occurs. And for that, you need to then start doing everything at the edge. And hence, it's, it's, it has to be you know, driven by IoT-based platforms. That's where we are seeing a lot of work with, um, and interest in uh, whether be it you know, vibration-based uh, uh, monitoring using vibration sensors or I alluded to, uh, you alluded to you know, uh, visual-based sensors, or even when you're acquiring the data, uh, computing or algorithmic uh, analysis of the data, and then taking, uh, you know, um, uh, taking over that and then controlling the equipment so that you prolong the life of the equipment. Because more and more operators, you know, they're trying to conserve cash. They don't want to spend too much money. And so hence they want to prolong the life of the existing equipment. The challenge is, you know, if, as they embark on the digital journey, there is a need to, of course, uh, uh, you know, invest in sensors, but then what can you do with the existing setup? Just to give you an idea, you know, we are um, somewhere in, uh, in an offshore environment, very remote. You would have people literally taking helicopter rides to these unmanned platforms and noting down readings from a from an analog gauge, and what we've done is essentially just put a uh, put a camera in front of that gauge, and uh, and we are now today transmitting as a time series data, which is which is just converting the gauge reading into a digital readout. So these are the, some of the technologies which we are seeing coming to the floor. Yeah, I think what I hear is uh, uh, with with the COVID impact of COVID, um, the the possibilities to operate uh, with less people uh, looking yep. at remote operations report. Uh, remote monitoring and remote operations. I think that that has been key or leading use cases uh, in this yep. current time. Yeah, and you mentioned about predictive maintenance, asset health. So yep. Krishnan coming to you on a question following with the devices. So what I have been seeing, there has been significant uh, interest in the standards, right? And equipment, sensors, uh, the collection of data. And then a lot of apps have been developed so far, right? Most of them would be uh, sitting in silos or, or has those uh, standard older legacy applications, right? So today when we're collecting that data, right, uh, for the asset health application where you have uh, asset health data, vibration data, other, right? And what is the tech which is available, uh, which not only collects all the data, integrate it to make uh, better decisions, and not just for the uh, operators in the field, uh, telling them that now issue is coming up, turn this machine off, but how does it also help a CEO of that company as an executive, he gets to know what's happening in the field and where they would be needing to invest uh, more uh, next year or this year so that the budget planning, financial planning can be done uh, taking the inputs which are coming from the field for the executive. So, yeah. Yeah, so for, for, thanks, thanks, Harvinder. Actually, very interesting perspective because a lot uh, of aspects actually related to predictive maintenance and other things are considered very, very operational in terms of nature. Uh, but let me, let me uh, throw in two perspectives into uh, this particular topic. One is, what is the strategic value of an implementation actually that is being done? Uh, so when I talked about the earlier use case, which is something actually which we had gone ahead and done uh, for Shell, uh, we are talking about uh, I was talking about actually a potential $150 million that can be unlocked in that. Uh, now, the, the, the fact is, there are two ways. One is in terms of what is the strategic value with which the organization can see it. So I'll give you, uh, so I talked about Shell. Let me give you another example. In the fracking space, uh, we have actually, we work with uh, the world's third largest uh, uh, fracking company. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is something actually a company having actually more than thousand frac pumps in operations. And when you go down to it and look at it in terms of an individual frac spread, uh, where there is a certain amount of fracking happening, you typically find anywhere between twenty to twenty five uh, frac pumps in operations. You look into it, considering that this is a twenty four bar seven operation, and frac pump is a failure prone asset, what happens is you go ahead and start pushing in buffers. So a typical frac spread based on our analysis that has happened has got 20% buffer. Now, the moment our solution, both in terms of 
the frac pump uptime as well as in terms of the overall frac optimization, the spread optimization started happening. We unlocked a tremendous amount of visibility into that operation, whereby the customers started running with one fourth of the buffer that they were operating. Now, if you talk about this, this if uh, there is visibility on this aspect to the senior management, the strategic management, you are talking about actually pushing out CapEx investments to the tune of actually 20% of your overall CapEx capacity that is there in the company. You don't need to invest on this. So that is actually uh, uh, aspects that drive the uh, drive towards senior management more in terms of business planning, financial planning, all of those aspects. But there is an even bigger important aspect that is happening, uh, which was the second dimension that I talked about, which is how your transactional decisions are being aligned to the strategic focus of the company. Now, there was, uh, uh, there was actually, for example, Debashish was talking about actually people traveling in into the field, uh, going to the remote location and actually doing some operation. In oil and gas, there is a typical milk run, what I call as actually a milk run uh, that happens every day in the morning, actually a field engineer will wake up uh, and go ahead and look at it in terms of covering one well after the other trying to see whether everything is okay uh, or uh, come back. It's like Debash has said, taking a helicopter to go there and see whether actually everything is okay and come back. And you might be visiting a completely wrong location. So how to synchronize the areas where correspondingly it is important is uh, very, very important. So today, for example, actually we go ahead and issue a route map for them based on the well health. So that actually all uh, operational decisions are directed towards things which are of strategic importance. Another example uh, that where we are going ahead and doing this is, uh, if you look at it, uh, there are many cases where equipments get taken up for maintenance, that to preventive maintenance. And 80% of the overall maintenance cost typically is related to preventive maintenance. And in fact, actually, it was an eye-opening uh, uh, aspect for me. There was a case where we uh, went ahead and looked at it from an oil sands operations perspective. 80% of the overall maintenance bill was maintenance on static equipment. So while all the talk is there in terms of actually rotating equipment, vibration, we being able to go ahead and look at it in terms of stock equipment, 80% of the cost was actually towards uh, static equipment maintenance. These are things like actually crew towers and uh, uh, cracking units and all of those on in managers. Now, if we dive in actually a step lower, the most important decision that needs to be taken up is when that maintenance has to be taken. And this is not just on the maintenance related or mechanical related decision, but depending on when the, what the crude oil price is. So it's a price weighted strategic decision that has to be taken related to maintenance on others. So that alignment between actually the strategic goals and the operational decisions is another perspective that is there in terms of this. So one is in terms of the senior management having better visibility, better control in terms of operations to take the right decisions. Uh, and the other aspect is in terms of the strategic alignment of the operational day-to-day -day decisions. That yeah, yeah. I think those are wonderful examples. Uh, the the area where you have worked, and when you were saying taking names of some of those equipments or assets, and there was a uh, there was just mentioned about pilot projects, proof of concept, right? And so, how do you basically choose an asset or equipment in industrial IoT uh, pilot project? So, is there a criteria like criticality or something? How how is that taken, Devashish? So here, um, uh, very good question, Arvinder. Actually, you know, what we've been working, especially here in the Middle East, which has got a huge amount of, you know, spread of assets and also, you know, um, the uh, the operators, which is typically national companies, they've spent a lot of money in uh, in basically, uh, and when I say money, I'm, I'm talking of cap capital items. Uh, and they do realize that, it's not gonna, you know, work uh, going forward in future. So they have listed out their critical items just to give you an idea that, you know, if you see how things are working out, more and more operators 
don't actually want to drill uh, like they used to drill in the past. Uh, so what they want to, in fact, uh, focus on is do more with what you have. So, and especially that um, that means that, you know, what are called as brown fields, your existing um, assets, they want to focus on those. And in many of those, there are a lot of artificial uh, lift technologies, such as, you know, electrical submersible pumps, or what are called as uh, sucker rod pumps, uh, gas lift uh, uh, networks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are the ones the, you have a lot of iron which is there, and and you need to optimize those uh, in order to uh, increase your recovery factors with the minimal amount of, uh, uh, of of capital investment. So they, in fact, what we've been working on is a list of uh, you know key items which also fits in the in their overall strategy. So whether uh, you know everyone has a, obviously there's a financial aspect to their to their corporate strategy. On top of that, there are also uh, issues around HSC, issues around the greenhouse gas emissions. So if you think about the big big picture topics, those are around uh, artificial lift uh, optimization, uh, uh, you know, reducing the amount of HSE exposure. And third is, you know, on greenhouse gas emissions. So based around that, we've picked up uh, a number of uh, projects which focus and uh, on uncertain critical items to, uh, to to bring to the fore the efficacy of IoT based systems to address those uh, issues. Yeah, um, I can give you an example of uh, uh, where we have uh, you know um, uh, we have instituted instituted an IoT based uh, system where uh, for monitoring and controlling of electrical submersible pumps, where you are essentially getting a lot of data um, as uh, during normal course of time, and you have to take, you know, uh, take the high frequency data and basically analyze and act on it so that you increase the run life of these pumps. And likewise, you know, there are, uh, uh, Krishnan was alluding to, uh, uh, you know, frac units where you have a lot of wear and tear. So then again, you know, how do you ensure that you minimize the amount of wear and tear? So your amount of, uh, uh, you know, investment that is there to fix those wear and tear, uh, you know, is managed um, as you go forward, yeah? Thank you. I think, I think great. So Krishna, you want to add some criteria to it? No, I think actually Debash touched, Debash has actually touched it fairly well uh, uh, ahead there. Uh, if you uh, really look into it, actually, Debesh was talking about this artificial lift. Uh, just a, a few data points. In a gas lift operation, how it works is uh, you are going ahead and taking oil and gas out of the uh, uh, out of the core of the earth, and you are pumping the gas in to be able to extract actually more oil and more gas. So, can you imagine actually there is a there is close to around 15 to 20 percent of the gas that is extracted out is essentially being pumped back to be able to extract more. You can't think of actually a more inefficient operation in terms of this thing. So, how to be able to go ahead and actually control those, uh, 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 control those actually this, and how to maintain the optimal pressure of gas that can actually be pumped back. Is, is a very, very critical decision in artificial life. Goes on to actually prove the point that Debashish was uh, talking about. In yeah, yeah, right, right. So even I had seen uh, certain scenarios where customers would have uh, the make and model, same make and model manufacturer of an equipment, and then it's okay, let's choose this one because it's easy to apply the same uh, learning to all bigger set of assets and yeah, yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, and since we are discussing about uh, POC pilots, so Krishnan, what has been the approach you have taken to scale the solution? So there are again, uh, different approach uh, people have taken, starting small and scaling up with the value creation. And there has been uh, the discussion that let's start big, otherwise we don't get that much attention and it should be success, right? So what has been your approach in scaling the solution? Uh, okay. So very interesting question, uh, this thing. Personally, I have a very strong view on this uh, uh, about, uh, uh, in the industry. Uh, see, the way I uh, see, it, uh, uh, see it is that on one extreme, you have certain amount of custom developed solutions. So if you go ahead and look at it in terms of doing it, 90% of 
things that are there in the industry today are these custom developed solutions and they won't scale. Uh, so these are places where you are going ahead and looking at it in terms of custom developing the solution corresponding to every single aspect. And any change to that, you are talking about again going ahead and actually maintaining those uh, uh, by using actually coders to be able to go ahead and actually do that. So this is one extreme of the solution spectrum that we see. If you flip over and look at the other extreme of the solution spectrum that is there. Uh, in fact, Debashish was talking about actually one camera focusing on a digital, uh, sorry, uh, an yeah. analog flow meter yeah. being able to convert it and look at it. These are what I call as actually pocket solutions. These are purpose built and very, very specific solutions that are there. Both of these spectrums will not scale. The reason being, if it is a custom developed solution, the moment you go from one use case to the second use case, it will not scale. Uh, same as the case, actually, you will be left with actually a lot of islands of information if you go with actually too many specific purpose-built oriented solutions. So the biggest, uh, biggest or most important aspect is to be able to go ahead and secure a configurable solution that can scale which means when you have a heat exchanger that has been, uh, we, had, uh, we just actually onboarded a customer uh, uh, out here in Houston, uh, where we are going ahead and doing actually the refinery of the future for them. This is a customer who has actually four uh, refineries across the uh, Tola region, which is Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana region. And we are looking at it in terms of being able to cover the entire refinery, refinery with the solution. So you have a heat exchanger, you need to onboard the heat exchanger. You have a uh, you have actually pump, which is pumping in uh, 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 the entire uh, fluid across the refinery. You need to onboard that. Then you have a static equipment, which is a CDU, which is a crude distillation unit or a vapor distillation unit or a cracking unit, which you need to go ahead and look at it in terms of onboarding. Now, if you end up with separate things for each one, or if you end up attempting to customize each one of them, God help you. And which is where actually many things are happening in the industry. So you start looking at it in terms of custom coding using actually an AWS or a Microsoft Azure in terms of building this particular solution, it will not happen. So configurability becomes very, very important in any solution. And that is the only thing that can go ahead and look at it in terms of actually uh, helping customers to scale implementations on that. So again, giving you an example, uh, I was talking about frack pump earlier. Now we went ahead and took up one project uh, for uh, 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 for a frack pump purchase. We took a seventy pump pilot initially, and these seventy pumps we delivered in six weeks time. Now that's one part. So many people will take actually probably four months, six months to deliver actually a pilot itself. Now, with, because of configurability, we are able to go ahead and look at it in terms of actually delivering it in six weeks time. But the even more interesting and important fact is after they signed off on the pilot, we onboarded 100 pumps a day and we moved on to the entire fleet of 1,000 pumps uh, in, a, in a week's time. Now, that is not possible if you go with actually a non-configurable oriented approach, and which is why actually that is a certain important aspect. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's great examples that you brought. So thinking through about the product you are building, making it more configurable, and setting the right foundations for it, right? To add new use cases without doing a coding, right? So that that's right approach. Yeah. But what uh, when you're mentioning of that uh, scalability, right? So the big challenge, what I see the AI programs uh, where they need effort is adding a data scientist to basically train or test the algorithms. And it, that has become pretty hard in the industry to generalize the model, right? So what is the approach Flutura has taken on that? So how are you doing it sure. to reach the sure. kind of scale which you have mentioned? Yeah. Sure. So uh, Harun, uh, the way we again actually look at it. We look at it actually from a transformational perspective. Uh, there is this entire bandwagon in the world that you find who go ahead and say, uh, I will go ahead and look at it in terms of actually uh, artificial uh, intelligence and deep learning oriented approaches, 
which will go ahead and actually solve this problem. Okay. First and foremost, uh, you go ahead and uh, tell uh, 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 operator uh, or a field operator or a production engineer saying that my algorithm is going ahead and saying uh, uh, this actually needs to be changed. Uh, the first question they ask is actually what? It's like uh, going ahead and actually telling a cardiologist saying this particular patient has to be taken up for surgery tomorrow. Uh, and my algorithm is saying it, but I won't tell you why, because I don't know on matters. So it's a question which is very, very important in terms of actually balancing out multiple aspects. The first uh, a few dimensions on those are, one is in terms of transparency versus accuracy. So the transparency with which actually the algorithms we need to go ahead and actually provide is important while accuracy being always important. So that explainable AI actually becomes an important element in terms of going ahead and doing it. And the moment you talk about explainable AI, what also becomes important is uh, you need to be able to contain and control uh, what are the types of AI that you can do. Because here you are talking about actually a certain amount of controls that need to be done, certain amount of features that need to be extracted by the data scientist. Are you going ahead and looking at it in terms of making it data scientist dependent becomes the question. And that's the place where multiple other alternatives are being brought to. For example, actually, we look at it in terms of hybrid AI. So the way we have gone ahead and looked at it is uh, there are first principles, simulation led solutions. Uh, it could be a hydro cracking unit, actually, which is being done by a KBC Kinetics or it could be a flow modeling that is done by a HISIS or a pipe sim uh, uh, that is there. How we can go ahead and attempt in terms of leveraging inputs from those to be able to go ahead and accelerate your uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning oriented uh, journeys. So that's actually one perspective. Now the second perspective, the way we look at this, it is horses for courses. You have to pick your horse which is actually most important for the specific uh, course that actually you are going ahead and going to. Um, to give you uh, an example, if you are talking about uh, FCCU, which is a catalytic uh, cracking unit in a, inside a refinery, uh, if you go ahead and tell them saying that, no, I will actually, my deep learning, I will use a deep learning approach and then I will not be able to go ahead and actually explain some of the recommendations that I'm going ahead and actually giving you, it won't work. It won't work. You are talking about a one and a half million dollar frack pump uh, where you are, need to go ahead and look at it in terms of doing it. Uh, if you say, actually, I can't explain, it won't work. Whereas, look at it actually from a $10,000 pump, which if you go to a refinery, probably there are 300,000 of them. Now there, most of the pumps are actually running with a spare, uh, running with actually a backup that is already present. In such cases, if you go ahead and suggest uh, saying that I will run a deep learning algorithm and then go ahead and actually do a pump scoring based on which actually you need to go ahead and take a decision, people are okay with it. Uh, it's, it's something like, uh, again, if I draw up an analogy, uh, if you use it for something like cataract scanning uh, on this, where it's a large volume thing that you need to do and you need assistance in terms of going ahead and doing it, some amount of non-transparent approaches also people are actually willing to go back because after the initial diagnosis, anyway, there is going to be a specialist review that is gonna happen. Whereas when it comes in terms of actually an open heart surgery, uh, you can't look at it, you need to look at it in terms of being transparent with them. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, I hope that touches. Yeah, so we'll, I think I lost you for last three or four seconds. But yeah, I think I think the starting with the first uh, principle, uh, simulation models, and then going to more deep neural networks uh, is, is a great approach. And also what I have seen most of the time um, when we are looking at the AI-based models, the customers uh, do not have the right data which can be used by uh, the programs. And that's where you need to add some sensors or add some additional uh, sensors to get that data accumulated for a couple of uh, weeks to months. And in that time, you bring those first principle models and then they, they do their job very well. Yeah, yeah. 
Great. Thank you, Krishna, for that. Uh, Debashish, I think in the initially when you mentioned about the cloud computing, cloud technologies, so what is yeah. the um, key driver there? So is it more of an on-premise or is it more of a public cloud or again, hybrid cloud is what is being uh, seeked by the customers in the Middle East region? Because we know there are a lot of, a lot of regulations around that. And then how do you manage to send all the data to cloud or do you also have edge computing and with 5G coming up? So how do you, how do you look at it now? Okay, good question. So, uh, you know, here in the Middle East, to be honest with you, earlier on, people wouldn't um, think too much about the um, overall cost when the, you know, uh, the, the, the price of oil was was good enough, right? But as you know, as you've seen the turmoil that we've had in the last decade, I would say, you know, it, it, the, the place has become extremely uh, cost conscious and they also realize that look, going forward in future, this is the way it's going to be. Yeah? So earlier on, they would all develop their, and, and you know, spend a lot of money in developing their own computing centers, uh, so high performance computing centers where they would spend a lot of money on uh, uh, on getting that uh, equipment in within their own, uh, uh, you know, control and then manage uh, uh, all the different uh, work scopes that, uh, that they had to do. So as a result, you know, um, uh, it, it was the way to do business, um, but o- over a period of time now they've realized that the kind of advantages that they can get by having um, cloud-based com- uh, computing is just humongous. And also more and more they want to, uh, you know, um, leverage on many of the um, technologies that are coming to the fore uh, in terms of uh, IOT um, in terms of you know advanced sensor uh, sensing etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah so what we are seeing is that now um, there is this drive uh, in the region uh, to to adopt uh, cloud now it could be private cloud uh, in country cloud there are various variants around it and I think you know we there is the journey has started. Have we reached there? Not yet. I think it's going to take a while. Uh, it's probably not going to be a public cloud for sure, uh, because data security is a key concern uh, amongst everyone. Uh, but you know, you, uh, now there are a lot of other the infrastructure players like you know Google, the Microsoft, the AWSs are also focusing a lot, especially around on the oil and gas customers out here. Uh, and what we are seeing from an uh, from an adoption standpoint of IoT, we are just seeing the very early stages because, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the critical equipment were all kind of you know monitored using a sort of a SCADA based system, which relied on uh, on on a radio network or a communication network, uh, where which was of course again capex intensive. Now. Um, the, you do have uh, you know 5G slowly coming in, but it's going to take a while before we get there. So with the existing infrastructure that we have, be it 3G or 4G, uh, we are now witnessing that you know how can we address some of the challenges, especially in areas which are, let's say, in the uh, empty quarters or in the desert area where there is very little uh, comm setup, using um, things like you know uh, VSATs. Uh, so when you use satellite based communication again then you know the costs go up in terms of uh, uh, how much they spend on on the bandwidth so uh, what you would need to do is to have that compute ability at where where the data gets generated and only uh, you know you you send uh, data uh, data points or any kind of alarms alerts etc based on an even based uh, mechanism yeah so so not necessarily all the time but only as and when an event happens. The same goes, you know, with HSE related uh, monitoring or, you know, it's it's again the same. So how can we be able to figure out uh, how my equipment, how my people uh, are working so that I become more efficient but without spending that all, all the extra amount that that needs to be spent on on beefing up your network and beefing beefing up your infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, I think I think that's that's pretty much uh, happening. We are looking at it now, but yeah, yeah, to to reach the level which you mentioned, I think it would take another couple of years at least. Yeah. 
yeah so i think we are moving towards the closure of it and just one final question to both of you uh, so devashish how is uh, your uh, company uh, number j leveraging the indian ecosystem of startups in the business and what is the way how can a startup partner with you yep. and what what would be the need for that and is there any specific areas where you are looking for solutions today fantastic so in fact you know shambhuji has been highly leveraged on india for a long long period of time yeah uh, so we today have uh, close to about 2000 employees um, in india not related to operations these are uh, primarily based in pune Uh, we have a large setup there, so we provide uh, uh, to, um, services to our global uh, software development and infrastructure services. On top of that, when we created Agora, we basically piggybacked on that uh, setup, and uh, we are partnering with a number of uh, uh, Indian startups as well. You know, I can name, for example, Infinite Uptime, which is uh, based in Pune. Uh, we are working with Uthunga, which is based in uh, Bangalore. uh then uh, machine sense which has got like krishna you know they've got a setup in india and and uh, overseas plus uh, you know harman uh, harman uh, you know they have a lot set up in pune so we working very closely with them so for us you know we um uh, our our business philosophy uh, is based on a partnership based ecosystem we welcome anyone to join in in order to for you to join in you know you can uh, uh, just look us up on linkedin we are there um, uh we uh, you know uh, we our platform that we have created um, uh, we've actually opened up our uh, software development kit which is there on github so you know what i would tell people is to visit our website agoraiot.com uh, you know um, uh, just follow us on linkedin uh, check us out on github so we're all there we we welcome in fact uh, uh, you know um, startups which have some uh you know uh, who can showcase certain deployment of technologies um which can address some of the different challenges uh, that we face one of the key things you know as a startup what you need to have is access to customers and of course financial part of it and uh, from shlambuje side what we uh, 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 you know what we benefit from is of course are the entry points into the customers organization and given the geographical spread and that's what uh, Uh, we we basically you know help our partners to 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 quickly monetize some of the you know good things that they have done yeah? we give them that platform yeah wonderful wonderful i think that's yeah. that's great and we have a lot of uh, great startups based out of india and you mentioned yeah. some of those here uh, krishnan coming to you so what i would seek from you is the recommendation for the industry any insights which you have how to work in this uh, ong sector with the major companies and if you could just mention about how are the uh, sales cycle and how much time does it take for closing a deal so around that if you could suggest to the fellow participants who have joined coming from the startup ecosystem yeah so definitely definitely harmin uh, obviously so uh, how long does it take to close uh, the answer is very simple forever uh so somebody somebody had actually gone ahead and told me when uh, we started our journey fairly early uh that uh, if you need to enter a big company like shell it's a 10 year journey <laughs> oh, no. but luckily for us uh, for us things are changing as well uh, in fact i still remember in 2019 when i got pulled in uh, shell had gone ahead and actually done an rfp they had gone ahead and looked at it in terms of evaluating about 20 companies and then finally told us actually you are not chosen and immediately after that three months after that they again called us back and told us saying that actually if you are interested to speak we can speak so we went back in and it, we realized saying that the solution that they had chosen turned out to be brochureware so the only condition that uh, uh, this person Uh, went ahead and actually put it. Us actually, we cannot use a slide, or and uh, we cannot use any brochure there. Uh, it has to be either you stand up in front of a board and uh, talk through it, whiteboard through it, and uh, that's, or you can go ahead and do a demo. That was a one-hour meeting. With that meeting, he gave us another three hours the next week. One and a half hours into that, he said, "Actually, I want to work with you." 
and decided to move forward with it at NASA. Uh, this one. It's a different issue that actually we took two and a half months uh, actually breaking our head uh, against the uh, Shell uh, procurement organization, which happens uh, in any of these large organizations. But the moment that is done, it was done. Now, these kind of decision-making speeds were earlier unheard of on this thing. So things are starting to change to a certain extent. But are we out uh, of the woods? The answer is no. Still, there are quite a lot of places where it turns out to be long lead, cycle, lead time, long cycles in terms of product. Uh, the key to success, the way I have seen it is, oil and gas as an industry knows the language of pressure, uh, flow, temperature, vibration. And uh, typically what happens is many of the startups, they go ahead and actually speak the language of rows, columns, algorithms, uh, all of those in terms of this thing. I don't think actually they, as a, especially as a startup, will be able to succeed. So unless otherwise, it's a functional solution that is being addressed. It is very, very difficult to progress and move forward. So my suggestion to all the uh, all actually the uh, uh, all of the folks actually out there is there has to be a very strong functional sway to your solution if you are going ahead and actually talking to an oil and gas person because their attention span otherwise is actually very very limited. And the second aspect is in today's market, especially in oil and gas, it's all about capex elimination and it is all about efficiency improvement. So uh, in fact, Debeshish actually touched upon it earlier. Uh, it is do more with what you have. So if your solutions have a very, very strong play related to that, then you will be able to go ahead and actually focus on it. Oh, by the way, oil and gas is not gonna go anywhere. There was a major debate that is happening in, in Texas as of now, where the entire last week winter storm and the issue that happened, actually, the fallout that happened because of this, it was primarily because of too much of emphasis in terms of non-ONG oriented uh, this. So there is a major discussion that is happening where it has to be there. For the next 25 years, actually, though the energy transition at a larger perspective is going to happen and it will progress, it doesn't mean saying that actually this industry is going anywhere uh, away in the near future. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Krishna, for this. I think we are uh, we are now going to the question answer round. Uh, let me look at that. But yeah, just to uh, bring few key points which I heard uh, both of you saying about how do we succeed is basically the ability to scale digital solutions uh, across assets and with minimal effort, right? And then focusing on the concrete uh, quantifiable value. Uh, which is getting created with this and also moving away from POCs, uh, pilots to more operationalized solutions, going at a bigger scale and barriers would be there still, but yeah, I think the measurement of that success is what needs to be defined with the technology involvement, what we are seeing as a step change. So I'm gonna take the questions round and let's see. Uh, first question is on how are you managing security related requirements for remote monitoring case in point in the recent water plant hack. So any, anybody, Devashish or Krishnan, you can take. Maybe I, I can take a stab at it. I, I mean, I kind of alluded to it uh, uh, that, you know, when we started our venture uh, in 2018, we knew that you know, um, uh, data security is going to be one of the critical aspects. So what we have done is that we have included, um, uh, you know, the, the best in class security um, measures, you know, um, in, in our design, uh, starting from the time you start, you ingest data, you store it uh, at the edge, then you transmit it, and then eventually uh, landing up uh, in its final uh, resting place. Uh, using a bunch of both software as well as uh, you know hardware uh, so for example tpm chips with a with a number of you know with uh, using cryptography etc um, 
uh, we are partnering, for example, with the likes of Palo Alto Networks. Uh, we have partnered with Prismo. I think uh, those guys are also, they have an arm in uh, Bangalore as well. Uh, so we are essentially partnering with the best in class uh, uh, technology providers. This is, of course, one of the key things. Uh, and you know what we have to do uh, in order for us to be accepted, we have to go through an extensive list of uh, requirements um, um, uh, which, which many of the uh, oil and gas operators require. So, you know, we have gone ahead uh, uh, and published a white paper on how we secure data. It's there on our website. Uh, so we are currently finalizing our uh, SOC 2 certification. So uh, a tradition from, a, from, a, from an independent agency. Those are the sort of things, uh, you know, which, which anybody will need. And I think, uh, you know, that's something which, which undergoes a lot of scrutiny. I can give you an example where for an NOC in Asia, uh, we had to go through a six month scrutiny of how we uh, actually you know, secure the data, uh, be it uh, again, you know, all the different aspects. In, in addition to that, how do we uh, you know, manage uh, users, um, authenticate users, et cetera, et cetera, all of those uh, aspects. Uh, so yeah, uh, I would say that you know, it's an extensive journey and, and there, there is a lot of focus on it. Um, and, and, and for us, you know, as I mentioned, it's been there from the time we actually conceptualized and designed our platform. Great, great, yeah. Moving to the next question, how feasible is it to incorporate security uh, within design at the beginning along with the solution instead of afterthought? I think Devashi should cover yeah. uh, points around this, but Krishna, you want to add something to it? You spoke about the product uh, development to have the, yeah. So. See, my, uh, my personal thought on uh, the security related aspect is clearly any breach will come with actually a, a fairly heavy consequence. So no doubt about it on uh, uh, this thing. And it is something actually which needs to be thought through right up front while you are going ahead and looking at it, uh, looking at going ahead and actually building a solution. So a mandatory need as a part of uh, uh, this. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, uh, I would strongly say that actually there is no... Uh, there is nothing to actually be worried about. So it's like actually today you move around with a smartphone uh, and you can potentially get hacked. But there are avenues to control it. And uh, the resolution for that actually would not be in terms of going back to a piece of uh, on. So this is something actually which you need to pick up and be able to tackle it. Various ways of tackling it. There are, uh, there are in fact, actually, if you really look into it five years back, Oil and gas customers used to say, no cloud. It's only on-premise. Today, if you really look into it, every single oil and gas major has a cloud implementation and they are preferring actually implementations on the cloud. Yes, it is a public cloud. You are going ahead and still actually, pri uh, sorry, private cloud and actually still uh, they are not working too much in terms of the public cloud. But with technology coming in, Exceptions will also come in, but you need to be able to go ahead and actually pick it up and manage it and move forward. Uh, in terms of foundationally thinking it through, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Great, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I think we are on time. Thanks a lot, Krishnan, for joining us in your early morning with us. Thanks for being here with us and shared your valuable insights and wisdom, I would say. <laughs> and thanks a lot, Devashi, to spend your evening with us on your Saturday evening. Tomorrow you have a working day. Good luck with that. <laughs> and back to you, Vijeta. Thank you. Thank you, Arvinder, for being a wonderful host. Yes, a absolutely. Pleasure. I echo and second that. Very very calm, very measured in the way he moderates everything. So thank you so much, Harvinder. And a very insightful conversation. We really appreciate the fact that as, as you know, it's a Saturday, it's a weekend, but you, the very fact that you gentlemen are taking the time and you're prepared so well for this. I think that's a lesson for a lot of us that prepare well, talk, uh, communicate it well, and that makes a big difference. And uh, we will continue doing all these kind of activities, uh, Harvinder. We want, and we have also shared about the Telegram group because that is steadily growing. Uh, you know, more people are joining in, more people are there. And uh, yes, so we look forward to more such learning sessions, knowledge sessions, and doing much, much more. I'm not too sure if Som is there or if any. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, so, yes, yes. Hi, Som. Yes, yes. So, thanks Som. a lot. I think uh, Debashish is fantastic to know 
that you are already working with three of the IoT Forum startups, right? And uh, please do reach out. So we have an industrial IoT group, which Harvinder and a couple of other folks, Dipesh and a couple of other folks are leading. Uh, anytime, any requirements, I would love to kind of circulate this within our ecosystem as well. And as you talked about vision analytics, frankly speaking, we have around 60 vision analytics focused on different industries, different areas in our uh, 2000 plus startups as well. And uh, uh, Krishnan, you have been kind of our pioneer, you know, back from 2014, we know you, one of the early startups from our IoT forum. So great to see the success and the learnings you have had. And uh, thank you for sharing some of this with the new cohort of startups that are coming along. And I think if you see, just to give you a bit of a statistics around uh, 2000 plus startups as of December, uh, I think the number is obviously growing. We are creating, we are updating the database as we speak. Close to 333 of them are actually funded in some form or shape. Many of these companies like, you know, obviously you, you probably Machine Sense, Detect, Up, Uptime, Flutura, all these guys have gone on to a different levels in a series A, B, C kind of a, a status. But we have a lot of additional startups kind of in all different sectors kind of coming up pretty strong. And as very successfully Krishnan has done, we are seeing the new crop of startups getting the initial product market fit in India and very soon kind of going global as well, right? And uh, you know, thanks for sharing your insights. And we would love to kind of stay connected. And the next crop of startups, we would love to engage with Slumberger. And of course, you know, Krishnan, if you see other opportunities and so forth, which specifically your company might not be focused on, feel free to reach out to us for getting other startups, you know, kind of partnering with you. Definitely, definitely. No, thanks so much. So actually, in fact, uh, uh, I still remember actually four or five years back when we were going ahead and looking at it in terms of taking the entire uh, uh, Thai IoT uh, forum forward. Uh, in fact, Derek, actually, my co-founder, was uh, very closely involved it, uh, in it as a part of uh, this thing. Got it. Really, really happy to see in terms of how it is going. Very yeah, and the good news is how this year we are going global uh, with multiple other Thai chapters joining us in fact, uh, Debashish, a big delegation is going to go to Dubai in October. We are taking right. a bunch of startups to the Dubai Expo right. show as well in October. Right. Right. Look forward to meeting you all. Yeah. Right. Up. Right. Up. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. And uh, all the very yeah. best. Stay safe. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.